Build Science 301, a Build Original Series brought to you by Anderson Windows and Doors, Arklin, and Huber Engineered Woods. Before we jump into Build Science 301 and all things control layers, I want to take just two minutes to highlight something that deserves more attention in our industry, fire protection. We talk a lot about air, water, vapor, and thermal, but what about fire as a control layer? That's where FirePoint from Arklin comes in. FirePoint is an advanced fire resistant sheathing that's engineered to give you serious performance without slowing down your build. It offers up to 53% more fire resistance than code requires, helping to slow flame spread, buy time for evacuation, and give first responders better access when it matters most. This is a solution designed for builders and architects who want real fire performance without sacrificing efficiency. The base of FirePoint is real CDX plywood, so it's lightweight, easy to install, and it's compatible with any cladding, so you're not locked into one finish or system. FirePoint is especially valuable in wildfire prone regions, but honestly, it's a smart choice for any project where safety is a priority. And when we talked about smarter building science, that's exactly what we mean products that both elevate safety and performance within a modern wall assembly. We're not just building to code anymore, we're building to face future challenges head on. So if you're designing for resilience, specifically fire resilience, stall flames and save lives with FirePoint. I'm Matt Reisinger, stay tuned for more right here on Build Science 301. All right, guys, welcome back to Build Science 301. We're on episode nine, Steve. We've made it quite a bit of progress already on this series. We are on roof assemblies, and this one specifically is gonna be cathedralized vented roof and a vented scissor truss roof. Yep. So we did ventilated, unventilated, we're back to ventilated again with two other varieties. Yeah, we're gonna basically change the volume of space, right? So a lot of people say, oh, can we cathedralize my living room or family room? Can we you know, put a cathedral ceiling or uh, you know, high slope ceiling? I call them volume ceilings, the cathedralized, I don't know, it doesn't shake out with me. But, uh, um, you know, volume ceilings. When we move the ceiling plane from flat to some type of slope, how do we solve for it? Right, and typically people are thinking of that as matching the pitch of the roof. Right. However, our other assembly is with a truss and uh, doesn't necessarily match the roof pitch. Right. But it's called, a, it's called a scissor truss. So why don't you uh, run through the detail on these? Yeah, so in terms of you know, a vented cut cathedralized roof, it's very similar. Anytime we're using this as a two by 10 or a two by 12, we're limited to what that dimension is. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have the luxury, you can go to a 14, 16, 18 inch LVL, but that price really starts going up. I've also seen those in iJoyce too. Yes, I've seen them in iJoyce too. And the, the price goes up, but the complication also goes up. That's true. A little, right? I'm not trying to beat up on the iJoyce, but there's certain things you just can't cut into it and have it bare right. without the bottom cord. There's a whole bunch of rules that come along with that decision. True. Um, whereas, you know, and, and like you said, whatever this is, let's say I think I drew these at six, this would match. So we get a six and 12. They're basically a set of parallel lines. Yep. Whereas here, typically if you do a truss, six and 12, this is usually about half. Mm -hmm. And so that would fall into that three and 12. So if you like the more gentle slope, then the truss solution is a pretty easy one. Yeah. Right. But you have to like those. And I actually prefer that. I'm, I've done some houses where we've done some steep, you know, 10, 12 pitch roofs, and this rises up 20, 20 feet above the floor. It's just, it's not a comfortable roof. These scissor Mine. trusses are really popular and very common, especially in Texas. My, my 1970s house that I lived in for many years that I remodeled had scissor trusses, and it was like a common feature through my whole neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. I like the, the more softer spoken um, trusses there. But basically, it is no different than, you know, we, we talked about the one here where the ceiling is down here. All we're doing is raising that up and basically confining that dimension a little bit more. And over here, same thing, right? This would have had the ceiling in there. Yep. And we're just basically raising it up 
there. So there's not a lot of change in the detail. However, however, the challenge is the challenges, they become a little tighter. Mm -hmm. Water, the same challenge exists there. Um, air tightness, this becomes a little bit of a challenge. We, you know, we had this solved for pretty easily. Now it's on the slope. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what do we do there? Vapor, again, we have a very small dimension there to deal with. And this is a vented roof, but the more that I solve for this, the more challenging I make that yeah, because you know, of that dimension. Another challenge when it comes to an air perspective on these cathedral roofs that I've seen a lot is just pockmarks full of recessed cans oh, yeah. uh, in that space, which is going to be a challenge both from, from an air ceiling perspective and an insulation perspective. Mm -hmm. And they've caused a lot of issues from a building science point Very on much. those cathedral roofs over the years. Yeah. So... They become, they're, they're certainly a challenge in their own right. And when we get to the, the trusses, you know, we're pretty good there. But the same things apply here. How do I deal with that air and vapor? And how do I get the insulation? Although this gives me a little bit better solution mm -hmm. than, say, this here. Right? Yep. So a little easier to deal with. Solutions. On the cut roof here, water for roofs stays the same. Good distance here. You know, one of the things I'm going to point out here is, you know, draw it in, rain gutter. Mm -hmm. All right? Getting a gutter system in there. Now, you might have your own opinions about the gutters, but understand that gutter is not necessarily solving the roof problem. That gutter could be solving a basement problem. Yeah, that's a, that's a great example. Right. And, the and certainly the splashback issue that happens uh, with houses with that lack of gutter, that rainwater cascading off the roof, especially a 612, an 812, a 1012, it's yep. really flying down there. It's splashing back and it's getting the bottom of the house wet. Yeah. Uh, I think we said it in an earlier episode, almost all the rot I find in a remodel house is in the bottom two feet of the house. Yeah. So remember that when you're dealing with water, you know, gutters, well, they can be your friend. Um, in terms of air, one, we want to vent. Mm -hmm. We want that air to go up. We do not want that air to go into that. We want it to continue up and go out. And of course, that certainly favors our moisture content, right? Yeah, that's right. There, to vent it out. Although this, this is a little different, getting that moisture up, because sometimes those are plastic or styrofoam baffles. So it's really about moving cool air and keeping this area the same temperature. Right and taking whatever moisture we can. Mm -hmm. But in this type of system, I still think you have to deal with this down here with ventilation. Yep. Right? You don't want to be just say, oh, it's a vented roof. I don't need to put in an ERV. Right? I don't think that is the answer. Um, as far as air, you know, I actually have done this. We've done it on the truss. Um, I haven't done it on here. But um, it could very easily be done. This is that one where we drop that down. And then when we put the cut roof on, we flip that up. So that goes up and it goes over the top of our membrane there and then just simply gets taped off there and gets taped off there. Mm -hmm. So we get continuity from our primary air barrier, our PAB, there out to our air barrier at the ceiling line. And again, you know, this has the two by four furring there. So we get a little bit of space here. We can put in some recessed lights. We could put all of that in and it's inside the insulation. But again, more importantly, let me use blue here, right? This is conditioned. This is unconditioned mm -hmm. on that line. So we want to make sure that we have that space there. And depending on the ceiling, 
Um, one of the things that I have seen here um, that I'll make a, a point of talking about that we've seen is a, uh, just a total problem. I've seen people do cathedralized roofs and say, oh, we're going to put up a really nice wood ceiling. And so what they do is they put up these pine boards, you know, that might be tongue and groove. And they don't put the air barrier. And what does that mean? It means through all of these cracks, <laughs> you got tons of moisture. Guess what happens about six months after that? All that moisture goes up, hits that, comes down, and you get puddles of soggy drywall right I've, there. I've also seen some serious uh, warpage on those uh, wood ceilings because they start cupping and moving and gapping because of all that moisture content. Yeah. So if you're going to do that system, just erase a little bit of this. If you're going to do it, then what I would suggest is you put in the drywall first, you put in the whole system, and then you can put the boards here. Now, I know we have that behind it, but I just like the idea of putting that in and having it a little bit of protection. Think of the wood as makeup. That's right. At that point, right? So let's take a look at scissor trusses. Now, one of the beauties of the scissor truss, like we talked about, is we get a really good dimension there. Yeah, that's nice. So we don't have to worry so much about the challenge to our thermal envelope. As far as venting, we come up here, it goes up the vent chute, goes up. When we get above 16 inches, we can cut that vent and then allow that to vent out. One of the challenges to a scissor truss roof is getting the insulation in there. Mm -hmm. Right, because a flat roof, you usually have head height. The guys can drag the hose up there. They can climb around up there on the trusses, spray it. But when you're in a scissor truss, I mean, it might be less than 30 inches for about five or six feet. It's true. Right, so it's a little harder to get in there. Most of the insulators, they do a really good job, but I'm saying it is something you have to plan for mm -hmm. when you're doing it. Um, as far as the air barrier, this is exactly how we did um, out at a project where we took that Myrex and we folded it down and then flipped it up and taped it off. It worked out beautifully. We have that in. In terms of wind washing here, you can see we have a two by here. The two by also keeps that truss from rolling. And a little bit of spray foam in there to basically weld that so we're not getting any wind washing. And then it gives us a nice solid vertical wall system to then blow in all of that attic insulation across the top there. And again, the structural screw there um, going in as a hold down for the truss makes that a really, you know, pretty simple solution. Yeah, it does. And as far as water on the outside, you know, again, get that distance and keep that distance, you know, as big as you can. You, I, I don't think you can protect the house enough. Well, that's for sure. I really don't. So, although I have heard one conversation, I'd like to get your take on this. So a, a very intelligent person, I sat in, they were talking about roofs, and he said, this really wants to be somewhere between 8 to 12 inches, which I would argue. But the argument that he was making was it's a minimum of eight inches because that's what you need to keep this wall dry. The 12 inches, his argument was once I get past 12 inches, the soffit, it really becomes, starts to become a maintenance issue. Hmm. And in that it's just a bigger soffit, it gets neglected. This might start to sag a little, oh, which really? if it's designed, huh. Maybe, you know, it, it isn't as big of a thing. But the argument was you needed eight inches to make that a good, solid water management issue. But 12 inches was kind of the magic number to get a really good, long-lasting soffit. But I've seen, you know, hundreds of years of buildings with big overhangs. That have lasted a very long time. You know, I remember early on in my my custom building career, I did a wood soffit for somebody, and I may, I told them, look, you know, I'm really worried. This wood, it's going to need to be restained. It's outside, 
And wouldn't you know it, we came back years later. It still looked like the day I installed it because it was in the shade. There was no sun on it. There was no water on it. It looked fabulous, you know, 10 years later. Very and well protected. It was super well protected. And I think, you know, I was obviously wrong. I was a young builder who didn't know any better. I just assumed that wood stained walls would need to be redone because of the uh, UV rays and the water. That wood soffit looked amazing. I'm a big fan of two foot overhangs as kind of my general. I did that in my house. Steve designed that into the Reisinger build project. I really like that extra forgiveness that two feet gives me. And frankly, whatever soffit material you use, whether it's painted hardy or some precious, gorgeous Delta Millworks wood, it almost never looks bad 10 years later. To me, they look amazing. Yeah. And to your point about rain screen sidings lasting a long time, those are ventilated spaces. They last a long, long time. They're in the shade. Typically, when you go longer than two feet, you get into a little bit more hoops when it comes to engineering. Yep. Uh, I have done a couple of houses with three and, and four cost. foot overhangs and cost. There's just a lot to it. There's the engineers getting involved. There's more to it. So, you know, if I'm designing a house for, for me and my family, I'm going to say, look, I, I typically like a two foot overhang. Right. Right. And, you know, we haven't shown it here. I've, I, will say I've taken this simple approach and just done a box off it. But I think you remember we went out and I did the pond house where oh, yeah. this went up and then we had an open cedar rafter tail, yeah. but it was still a vented roof, mm -hmm. right? And we just, instead of having the vent there, the vent was in a little shadow box here and yep. it went up and went in and then the rest of it was basically open. So again, you know, just because you say, oh, we're gonna do a vented roof. It doesn't mean that you can't do an open rafter tail or you can't do a big overhang. There's solutions for those, but we're really here talking about the building science behind these details and what are the risks, what are the challenges, and then, of course, what are the solutions here, so. Well, we got some good stuff coming up. We've tackled a lot of good things on roofs, but we actually have two more to go. Next up, Steve, the overvent cut roof and the unvented Monopoly roof, one of my favorites. I was going to say, that's got to <laughs> be one of your favorites. That's pretty much my favorite. <laughs> With that being said, guys, like our friend Joe Stebrick would say, it's not rocket science. Build science. Don't forget. We got quizzes. We got booklets after this. So the fun doesn't stop at the vibe board. That's right. So at the end of each episode of Build Science 301, you're gonna have the opportunity to take a five question quiz, answer all five of those right, and then go through all 11 modules on Build Science 301, and our team's gonna send you a certificate that says that you passed Build Science 301. And we have that for 101 and 201, right Steve? There we go. Don't forget, this is totally free, there is no charge. I think you should really take the time and make sure you get recognized for your efforts and your time. Get that certificate, this is a really big deal and this is a good foundation for the rest of your career. Build Science 301, a Build Original Series brought to you by Anderson Windows and Doors, Arklin, and Huber Engineered Woods.